you very much and to the folks at City Age uh, for the organization of this uh, incredible presentation and hearing from the mayor of Sioux Falls. Uh, mayor Tanaka and I would just say I'm a native of Fargo, North Dakota, so I definitely got the uh, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota joke. And of course, now I'm in Rochester, Minnesota, so I often hear about people who booked a flight to Rochester only to land in Rochester, New York. So I have uh, some familiarity with the uh, challenge of name location. Uh, and uh, Bruce, it's an uh, honor to be uh, part of a program that you're a part of. A, read your work and your contributions to the thinking around uh, urban America for my entire career. So it's incredible to be in the in the same room virtual as it is as you. We have a, a great uh, set of panelists and people who are going to present the work going on in some three really incredible cities and, and of course, including Rochester, Minnesota, a fourth. I think what I'd like to do is uh, invite comments from each of the each of the mayors and Corey um, to kick this off. And then we have a few questions that uh, we're prepared to, to ask each of them. So uh, with that, uh, perhaps uh, uh, Mayor McLean, I would just start with you and, and the work you're doing in Boise. Sure, well, thanks for having us, Patrick. Um, it's an honor to join and the other mayors and to have these, this conversation. I gotta say um, our city, Boise, Idaho is one of those the fastest growing cities in this community, but we often also struggle with name confusion. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, my son was um, touring a very well-respected small college in Western Massachusetts. And when he said he was from Boise, Idaho, the tour guide said, oh yes, way to have the Midwest represent. <laughs> and I said, welcome to the beginning of explaining that Idaho is neither Iowa or Ohio, but actually an incredible place in the Rocky Mountains um, with one of the fastest growing cities in the country that has incredibly interesting and innovative residents and a lot of opportunity ahead. And I wanted to touch on just a couple things. Like every city in this country, particularly in the last two years, rural areas, cities alike, we face a lot of challenges. But what we've found here in Boise is that um, the piece of Boiseans where we're a relatively young city, um, now we're a city on the rise, um, we're growing at a time that's different as a mid-sized city um, than city, cities saw growth in the past. And um, we are marked by residents who really live intentionally here and are committed to coming together to face challenges, turn them into opportunities, and work with us to ensure that we have a city for everyone. And a major um, component of in my administration, the things that are important to me, and most importantly, the things that are important to Boiseans um, is our work around climate action, because we see climate action and our roadmap to carbon neutrality by 2050 citywide and by 2035 as a municipal government as a key to long-term resilience and importantly, economic opportunity um, and growth and opportunity for our residents to have the jobs of the future in the long run. So look forward to talking about more and about that more, but also to hearing um, from these other great communities about what's happening there. And we're definitely going to probe that a bit more, Mayor. And uh, before we do that, uh, Mayor of Reno, uh, Hilary Shivi, um, love to hear some opening comments from you as well. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Patrick and City Age, for having me. Um, you know, I am the mayor of the biggest little city in the world. Um, I don't think people confuse that, so I don't have sort of the issue that <laughs> Mayor McLean does. <laughs> but um, most of you probably know Reno as being a predominantly gaming city. But since I've been elected, I've worked really hard to diversify our economy from things like Burning Man to blockchain. So if you haven't been to Reno in a while, I hope you will come and check us out. I'm sure you'll like what we've done with the place. And good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. We're going to ask more about Burning Man before this is over <laughs> as well, Mayor. Um, before we do that, uh, uh, Corey, would you uh, describe a little bit about the work you're doing in Erie, Pennsylvania? Sure. Um, Corey Cook, um, it's a pleasure to be here with um, everybody, the mayors. Um, I am the Director of Operations and Logistics here uh, for the Downtown Development Corporation. I actually met with Bruce Katz this morning. Um, gave him some tours yesterday of some of the work we're doing uh, here in Erie. Um, so it was good to have him you know, joining us from Erie. Um, but 
pleasure to be here to share some of the work that we're doing here. Um, as it was mentioned, I'm working on building out a uh, delivery network where I'm at currently in the center of downtown. We are one of the poorest zip codes in the entire state, uh, one of the poorest in the country. And uh, through the work of the Downtown Development Corporation, we've been able to bring a grocery store into an area that's a designated food desert. And so one of my challenges moving forward is going to be uh, building on a delivery network to make sure um, residents in the local downtown area and, and beyond can get fresh groceries. So I'm excited to share some of that. Great, thank you. We look forward to hearing more. I'll just say a word or two about Rochester, Minnesota, home to Mayo Clinic, uh, the number one healthcare provider in the country and perhaps the world, um, and home to an initiative we call Destination Medical Center, which really uh, recognizes and celebrates the important relationship that this community has with medical innovation and scientific innovation. It is really an opportunity to, to tap into the, uh, the idea of an of a industry cluster and really um, understand how, does, how do we grow beyond a, a single uh, major institution into a much more diverse economy. We're also led by an incredible mayor, Mayor Kim Norton, who um, uh, having served as a state legislator and helped found the Destination Medical Center initiative in her current role as mayor is leading a, a lot of innovative work, including specifically, how do we ensure that people who have uh, historically oftentimes been left behind in, uh, in prosperity really uh, take advantage of the new wealth building that's occurring through the Destination Medical Center initiative and specifically, an idea that she's pitching to the Bloomberg Mayor's Innovation Program around career pathways for BIPOC women in the construction industry and construction trades. And at, at, at some point, uh, I'd like to share more about that. But before I, I do that, I would like to turn to each, each of the panelists and ask a, a more general question that um, I think is on a lot of people's minds, which is, as we uh, have experienced and every city has experienced disruption uh, through due to COVID and the and pandemic, is there one or two things that, uh, that came out of this experience that either surprised you or, or further affirmed your confidence in your own community that is really a, a takeaway from the crisis that is COVID-19 that, that um, might be helpful for other communities to understand and appreciate. And Mayor McLean, I'll just uh, turn to you first on that question. Sure, thanks, Patrick. Two things came to mind, because as you said, um, this time was really, really hard. And what I found that was not necessarily surprising, but I'd, I'd rather address it as reaffirming in terms of who we are as a community. And I talked about this recently in my State of the City address. Um, are the everyday heroes that we encountered. Um, and a couple I wanna highlight on. So there are two, I mean, there are two issues I'm gonna touch on here, but first are the people um, that really make Boise who she is that came together as we always have with this unity of purpose to address a challenge and create opportunity where we could while we were making sure that we took care of people. And seeing that um, in the midst of all the struggles was incredibly reaffirming about who we are, um, who we can be and where we'll head. Um, and one organization um, that, I, that comes to mind in particular um, is an organization that was started in the height of the stay home order called City Good. Um, and Corey, I think it was referenced that you all are working on connecting food to families. And this is an organization that came together um, by some entrepreneurial restaurant owners that are committed to local food. And they saw that farms, um, restaurants were shut down. So restaurants you know, wanted to do something to keep their workers active and had kitchens at the ready. And um, farms didn't have any place to send their food because restaurants were open to serve the public. And then you had families and school kids that typically relied on the schools as that, and community centers as that place through which food was distributed to them. And so this organization came together, this group of people came together, started an organization um, that created solutions for all those parties. So the farmers, um, still provided food to a lot of higher end restaurants who paid their staff and kept their kitchens open to create the meals that were then distributed by the school district and others to families in need. And the great thing about this is that it's stuck. 
And so now they're still working with the school district, with the city, with others to um, advocate for um, and grow a local food supply and um, while also uh, making sure that that food supply connects with those that rarely have access to it and that high quality local food and really need it most. And so there's that. And then I also wanted to highlight um, that we learned once again, we were reaffirmed really um, how important our open space and our connection to both our river our parks and importantly, our foothills are at the, at the um, foothills of the Rockies are to our residents where we saw three times the usage in our parks along our Greenbelt, which is along the river and in our open space. And that didn't let up once everybody went back to work. And so um, it's helped us um, see again, the importance of open space in terms of resiliency um, and quality of life, and then to continue working with the community to set aside more um, and particularly to commit to the National America the Beautiful Initiative, which is a commitment to set aside additional open spaces, connect, um, protect clean water, um, and restore habitat to natural areas. A lot of affirming uh, comments in the in the chat box, but uh, in particular, um, just noting everyday heroes, uh, city for good, something that's stuck, an innovation that's stuck coming out of it, and of course the value proposition of open space. Mayor uh, Shivi, from uh, tell me about what what came out of the Reno experience. Mm -hmm. Well, one message of positive and then one message of, of a challenge, but I would say um, for me, I've really embraced um, arts and culture. And I think it was a time of certain, you know, very much uncertainty. And, you know, some of our hardest hit were our artists. Mm -hmm. And so we really started to collaborate with our artist community, um, which we do on a massive level anyway, because I, like I said, I'm a big proponent of Burning Man, but even more so to sort of spread this message of hope and to really bring people together when we were feeling so isolated. And Mayor Fisher from Louisville, Kentucky started a project called the City Song Project. And so we, we got artists from all over our city and all over the country, um, thanks to Mayor Fisher, and brought all these incredible artists together to create this incredible uh, compilation of songs um, for you know the entire country from every city. So that was really cool, but it really sent a message of hope. And also we're not forgetting about our artists um, that really sort of shaped the culture of this city. So that I think was really important because artists really have been some of the hardest hit in this pandemic when it certainly comes to work and creation. And the other thing, the challenge, you know, for me, and I think a lot of cities understand this and they see this, but it's one of the biggest that I focus on is mental health. And I was so incredibly worried because of the isolation, because of the fear, the uncertainty. So many people were losing, you know, just aspects of their life that they weren't used to. And especially people that might not struggle with a mental health challenge, right? We saw a lot of that. People that had never struggled with a mental health challenge were starting to feel isolated and anxiety and things like that. But also, you know, I think mental health is one of the biggest pandemics that we don't talk about because of the stigma. And so I think it's an opportunity to really start to think outside the box. And for me, I started to think about you know, what about all these people that can't access healthcare or therapy or things like that? So I partnered with a, a company, some of you may or may not know, it's called Talkspace. It's a national company. It's an app-based company used by Demi Lovato and gold medalist Michael Phelps to um, use some of our CARES Act money to provide memberships to every single resident in my city so that we could really focus on you know, the mental health aspects and the access and the affordability, because I think that is one place where cities really, really struggle. I'm sure Patrick knows this better than anyone being sort of the expert in the room, you know, with Mayor Clinic and all of them. But um, for me, I, it was really, really important that we provided access to mental health in a way that you typically, you know, don't see, um, you know, sort of done. And it was, you know, you know, some people sort of push back on it, but for the most part, I can't begin to tell you the stories that I've heard from, you know, especially younger generations using this type of app and creating this partnership um, where they said they felt like committing suicide and that they had a therapist available, but, you know, it really changed their lives. And, um, and I think, you know, it's about 
prevention. I think, unfortunately, in cities, a lot of times uh, we're reactive instead of proactive. So I really felt like that was a major approach that Reno needed to take on um, because I think we're all seeing unprecedented levels of homelessness and relapse and addiction. So um, those are two sort of the things that I really tried to focus on. And obviously, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here in Reno, but we also have a lot of challenges like other cities. And I think uh, Mr. Katz brought up some incredible points that this is exactly the type of thing that these breakout cities are focusing on. Well, I just have to say that as an outsider, um, hearing your story about using CARES dollars for the mental health app um, seemed like it seems like a very bold move and a, and a risky move, and um, <laughs> but one that was one that was well received, um, and I, I congratulate you for that. And I think so much, and I think. Mayor Hawken was talking about this, uh, Mayor of Sioux Falls, about how close to the how, how close to the problem and, and and the potential solution that mayors are. Um, that that the, the biggest issues facing our country really get can get addressed at the at the local level, and I think that's an example, and 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 perhaps really connected to the kind of personal aptitudes or or life experiences that mayors in other city leaders have. Before I turn to you, Corey, I just want to ask, you have a reputation, Mayor, of, of uh, really using arts as an economic development strategy. And, and so when you talk about supporting the artists, it's, it, it, what I hear from that is you're really trying to support the economy of, of, of Reno. Would you just say, would you say something more about that? Yeah, I, you know, we had an earlier call, and so Patrick and I kind of got into this, but I think this is really, really important, especially if you work in cities. And one of the stories that I tell is that, you know, growing up here, people would say, where are you from? And I would say, oh, Lake Tahoe, because kind of I was embarrassed by, you know, this, this image of Reno, um, obviously Reno 911 and things like that. And I think, you know, look at those as opportunities, actually, when you start to embrace some of those negatives, like for many years, I don't know why, but the city really kept Burning Man sort of this deep, dark, dirty secret that was, you know, sort of happening right outside of Reno. And whenever I became mayor, I was like, that's crazy. We have all these incredible artists and creators and let's create this economy and ecosystem. And that's exactly what we did. And so you know, something that was a negative for so long turned out to be such a massive economic driver and culture driver for my city. And so like sometimes, you know, embrace those things that might be perceived as negatives. But with the arts, we know that it brings a massive, massive economic impact. And it's just really been impressive to see artists move here, entrepreneurs move here because of this incredible sort of arts and culture movement that we've been able to create in Reno. And I always say that arts are a way that you package a city. Think about it like I, when I go to great cities, like I can think of San Diego, whenever I go there and I walk out right outside the airport, they have this great art installation there. And I think when you see that happening in cities, you say, wow, what does the rest of this city have to offer? And so I think, you know, for me, it's really a way that you package a city. So think about, you know, arts and culture being a fantastic economic driver, um, because oftentimes we see it as a massive tourism driver. I mean, look at New York City, the places that people go because they want to experience art. And the other wonderful thing about art is that it's very nonpartisan. I'm a, you know, a nonpartisan mayor, but it's not Democratic and it's not Republic, uh, Republican. So, you know, it's a great thing to embrace. But like I said, it's it's been phenomenal growth in my city to really embrace the arts. And I think a lot of um, cities really miss that opportunity. Thank you. Corey, I just want to turn to you for a moment. Um, you are relatively new in your role. Well, actually quite new in your role. Uh, yep. the Erie Development uh, 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 Corporation. And something uh, Bruce Katz said about uh, uh, what I, I took a note here, Community, uh, Community Equity Foundation. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that, uh, as I learned more about the organization that you work with and really working in some of the poor zip codes in in Pennsylvania, your work is probably very different in terms that when compared to uh, perhaps uh, partner organizations. And I, I just wonder 
how do you, where do you see as key partners that you look to or your organization looks to to help build the prosperity um, for, the, for, for the entire community, but particularly in some of the, the hardest hit zip codes? Sure. So our, our CEO, when he started um, his role, he wanted to look at things through two different lenses. One is a social impact lens and another economic lens. And he really steered the organization uh, with, in that direction. And so when we started, one of the first things we did was built a relationship with the city. So we have monthly meetings with the mayor, his team to make sure we're in lock and step with them uh, in planning and making sure that they're aware of everything we have going on and vice versa. Um, we have a community engagement council, which I was a part of uh, before I started my role here. And so those are different um, community leaders from across the city and also some of our senior high rises downtown. We talked to, to people inside of the senior high, uh, housing high rises and we had them come in and uh, give input as to what they wanted to see uh, here downtown and help guide some of those decisions. We also look to our board organizations. Um, Erie Insurance is a, um, a Fortune 400 company here right in the center of downtown, uh, one of the main anchor institutions. Um, Gannon University, uh, UPMC Hammett, well, mm -hmm. the, the major hospitals here. So uh, really it was just a collaboration of across the board, um, communities, um, community leaders, uh, city government, state government, and then also um, the, the business community as well. And would you say that, and again, understanding you're new in your role, but you've certainly been uh, operating in the in the orbit of all of this work in your prior roles. Would you say that the opportunity for collaboration has um, become more more opportunity? Or I would just say, is it is it more is a fertile field for collaboration today than perhaps um, pre pandemic? I think one of one of the things that has been very interesting. I heard an interesting comment yesterday. In the center of our downtown, people haven't seen a crane being operated in a very long time, probably close to 10, 20 years since they've seen a crane being operated. For me, that signals hope, growth. Um, I, when I go to Toronto, when I go to Philadelphia, uh, when I go to, to other cities, when you see cranes in the sky, that means there's movement, economic movement, there's growth, development. And not seeing that here in the city for a while um, was definitely disheartening to a lot of people. Um, so seeing that growth and that development has given people a lot of hope, a sense of pride. And uh, for me, that's one of the, uh, the main things for me because I, I come from a background where I've worked with a lot of youth as well. Yep. And for them to want to stay, they have to see hope and they have to see opportunity. Now that crane might not equate to a hope, to hope and opportunity for them, but at the end of that process, when the food hall is done downtown and they have a gathering place in which I call the community's dining table, the, the community dining room downtown, which we're trying to, to build and develop, that's where they'll start to see the benefits of having construction and those things downtown. I like that term, community dining table. It's very powerful and compelling. Um, Mayor McLean, early on, uh, I wanted to get back to something you talked about in terms of the sustainability and climate change agenda that you've been working on. But what strikes me is uh, much like uh, the mayor of Reno talking about uh, arts and culture as a part of an economic strategy. I think you are also using energy and sustainability and, and climate change action as a part of an economic development strategy. It's, it's, could, you, could you just say more about that? Yeah. Um, and so often, and we talked about this a little bit in the prep, people will say, oh, well, the environment and climate's over here and the economy's over here. In fact, I had a city council person once tell me when I was on the city council that um, I cared about the environment and he cared about economic development. I said, no, 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 they are so interconnected. Um, and when we forget that, then we're not like, putting all the cards on the table and playing all the opportunity we have to ensure that our community can thrive in the long run. And so for us, yes, there's an environmental and, and importantly a health component to ensuring that we are resilient and the, in the face of climate change and that we can mitigate the impacts for our community. Hotter days, 
impacts health. We need to plant more trees to cool our neighborhoods. We need to make sure we have enough water um, in the long run, all of that. But then by doing that, by taking care of people, you're also gonna have to innovate to create the, the, the tools and the solutions needed to be able to meet the challenges of climate. And through that, we build an economy. And so for us, we have committed, as I said, to carbon neutrality. Um, just recently, I was able to announce that we will beat our clean electricity goal as a city government by as many as seven years. So we'd aim for 2030 and we expect to meet feeding municipal government with 100% clean electricity by 2023, as early as 2023. Um, and that's important as we electrify because it creates space for innovation. Um, we are working with Republic Services to electrify our garbage and recycling fleet. And I, this I think is a, is a perfect example. At some point somebody said electric garbage trucks. I was like, okay, that's great. If, you'd ever, if I'd ever thought I was gonna be talking about how excited garbage trucks were, I wouldn't have believed you. But it has such a big impact on um, not only our own goals in meeting and beating our goals, but in the um, likely outcomes and jobs of the future. I jumped in one of these trucks with the manager of operations um, I, and he rode me around. They were quiet. It was cold, it was cooler, um, it was fast. And I asked him how he and his drivers felt about this. He'd been with the company for 30 years after coming out of the military. And he said he loved it for all the reasons that I'd identified. Um, but then he said what was most important was that his company was innovating and thinking about the future. And that always meant that guys like him would have jobs. And for, that was for me, nailed it. Such a perfect example of how climate innovations, um, making sure that we meet the challenge of the moment and prepare for the future also lays the groundwork for economic opportunity for everyone. And just recently announced that a company was locating their Western manufacturing facilities here. And a large part of it, they said, was because of our own climate goals and the fact that they too would be able to say that they were powered by clean electricity. So we're protecting health, we're building an economy, um, and we're you know, doing it in such a way that it, it benefits everyone here from current pocketbook prices, but long-term having the jobs of the future. So I love I, this is really so powerful and I wish we could spend more time just on that, on that particular subject, but in the, in the minute or two we have remaining, I'm gonna just kind of build on this thread of innovation because in many ways, mayors are at the intersection of innovation and application. And uh, so you talked a lot about innovation uh, Mayor Shivri and Corey, what what area, what, where do you see the next opportunity for innovation in your own particular work? Um, and I, we have a lot of great questions in the chat box in the Q and A, and we can't get to them, but but it does center around innovation. And I'm wondering if some of the questions do. And tell me, but like, what's on your horizon? Where do you want to use that innovation muscle to solve the next problem in Reno? Yeah, well, great question. And I think for many mayors, we're always trying to tackle everything and everything is a priority, right? And there's so many from, you know, our, our local economies to mental health, to arts and culture, to infrastructure. So many things are going on in, in cities. Um, I think there's a really exciting opportunity in blockchain and DeFi and some of these, um, and I, it's very early on. So, you know, it's people are just starting to talk about it, but I've kind of been following this space for a few years because I'm an entrepreneur at heart, a tech entrepreneur. And so, um, but decentralizing, you know, sort of payments and how we do business in cities, I think that's going to be a game changer, especially for people who are, um, you know, unbanked. Um, and so I think uh -huh. there's a lot of yep. opportunity that we're going to see. And actually, my city is um, we're creating an NFT uh, to raise our money for public art. Um, and so you're going to start hearing a lot more about NFTs and, and how that, you know, cities can spur their own economies, um, because I think that that's really going to be you know, um, sort of a game changer as we look into the future. If you kind of see Miami and what they're doing with city coins and other things like that, I would yep. say it's definitely a space to watch. And so, you know, start sort of educating yourself on it now. But, um, you know, for me, we're going to continue to work on mental health and, and affordable housing. And one of the things um, I will tell you that's been really successful for me, and it just keep thinking, you know, innovation and how you can sort of break those barriers. But I, I'm doing a program program is called a thousand homes in 120 days 
And, you know, that's putting fees on the back end for developers instead of the front end so we can get shovels in the ground faster and spur economic development. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways that we innovate in cities, but, you know, there, um, there's just, you know, so much opportunity and it's exciting to be, you know, one of those cities that is thinking into the future. Well, with that, and uh, I'm sorry, we're going to have to have that as the last word. And I will just say, I'm so looking forward to uh, a site visit to Reno and to Erie and to Boise. And there is so much um, that you've shared and so much that we can all learn once as we build this innovation muscle that really keeps our, our cities growing and thriving and vibrant in the future. So thank you all very much. 